Hi, welcome back to the Charles B. Hayes Family Sculpture Park here at the University of Notre Dame. This is an important extension of our museum, which is just a couple hundred yards up the road, but it's a place where large works of sculpture can live, where they resonate in the natural environment in a particularly meaningful way. The way in which native grasses, plants, trees, really celebrate this particular region is greatly enhanced by the placement of works of art like this iconic piece by the British sculptor David Nash. It's called Red Throne and in order to understand it as Red Throne and to fully appreciate Nash's career let me take a step out of the way so you can see the work more fully. For the last four decades David Nash has been one of the most important British sculptors working on the international scene. In particular, Nash's repertoire has been based around his work with the natural world, specifically the use of trees. Falling into the early moments of the environmental movement, David turned away from the traditional materials of sculptors like bronze, stainless steel, more recently various types of metals and woods, and focused in an abstracted way on the use of trees. He lives and works in Wales in a relatively desolate area, but it gave him an opportunity in that isolation to have ample studio space and the opportunity to work with select pieces of trees that he found, or eventually, as his reputation grew, were brought to his attention. In his studio, whether he was inside or outside, most of his work was done carving through the use, boldly through the use, of a chainsaw. And if you look closely across the surface of most of Nash's wooden sculptures, you can see the tooth mark, so to speak, of those chainsaws. He worked in terms of carving those surfaces, not just in terms of capturing shape or form, but with some general acknowledgement of how that form would continue to change over time. Wood, being a natural material, would continue to open, break apart as it aged. If you consider this piece in its outward form, if you think about the outlines or contours, you can perhaps easily envision the upright trunk of a tree. There is an inherent stately quality which is conveyed even as Nash carved the work. Then as you move down the front and across the sides you can see how Nash initially intervened with that tree trunk where he began to communicate with nature and craft something that was new. Ultimately there is a kind of spoon-like quality which is created as you go from top down through the central shaft and about a third of the way up from the bottom, this kind of basin. Yes, in many ways, he's referencing cultures that have traditions for creating grand spoons, oftentimes as a lineage piece or a symbol of power and royalty. There is that essence here, but this is on a grand scale. This is something very large. This is something that's very powerful. That the base of what we might think about as a spoon actually becomes the seat of a throne, another form of power. So in this piece, which is roughly carved, which starts out with a natural form, which has the intervention of human nature, which has the intervention of human craftspersonship, which references historical traditions of crafted spoons, actually becomes a symbol of power. Power coming forth 
from nature. Look across the surface. You can see, yes, the marks, as I mentioned, of the chainsaw. You can see pieces that give evidence of the wood. You can see cracks along the edges. It's not highly polished and refined as, say, traditional forms of sculpture might be. But it has a rawness. It has an energy. It really speaks to this conversation between a human being and the natural world. Now, having said all of this, you're probably wondering, well, geez, won't many of Nash's pieces, especially if they're left in the out of doors, eventually crack, crumble, and fall apart? And the answer is yes. And in some ways, for those exterior pieces, that's part of the poetry of the piece. That's part of the beauty of what is to come. However, this piece is actually made of bronze. About a decade ago, David Nash was encouraged by several friends, curators, colleagues, to think seriously about taking just a handful of works, just a very, very few outdoor pieces that were made and carved in wood, and translate them into bronze but to do so in such a careful and precise way that the integrity of the wood original would be captured. Therefore, as bronze, if that integrity could be captured, there would be something lasting. There would be something more permanent in bronze than the wood original. Nash agreed and Red Throne was one of those first opportunities that he took to slightly alter his tradition of carving, of creating, of sculpting, and extending it a little bit further for the sake of time and place. But let's look across the surface once again. Look at how incredibly precise the casting has been. You can see the knots in the original wood. You can see the cuts from the artist's saw. You can see the age marks as the wood began to pull apart. All of that is captured and very beautifully unified in a single deep warm patina or surface coloration. The artist's original intent is preserved. The artist's idea about communicating with nature is extended. And in some ways, because this is made of bronze, Nash is communicating with the larger history of sculpture in which bronze was so important and continues to be so important for so many artists. Red Throne an essay by an artist truly engaged with trees and the natural world, but extending himself, pushing himself to continue that tradition and create something that will last forever. Thank you very much. Hope you come out to enjoy the Hayes Family Sculpture Park very soon.